Way over on the left, the inert gases, we don't have that at all. Let me list a few of them. These inert gases should be thought of as being specks or discrete particles. They don't have neighbors. If they did have neighbors, they would be near each other, and the interactions would have to be strong enough to keep them together. But at room temperature and pressure, we don't observe that. If we take helium down to extremely low temperatures, like 4 Kelvin, they will go ahead and get together. You've taken out all the energy. They're not going to be zooming around in the gas phase, and we can show a slight attraction between them. But where we live, certainly already melted and then boiled. They are gases at room temperature and pressure. Molecules, remembering that these are nonmetals, fall into three different categories to separate low melting points to high melting points. Type 1 are going to be your nonpolar. These nonpolar molecules, just like the inert gases, have very little attraction between them. We call them dispersion. or London forces. Let me make a little picture up on the board of dispersion or London forces. These London forces or dispersion forces are found in inert gases and these nonpolar molecules. Let me show a methane molecule as just written out as CH4 and another one as CH4. These are tetrahedral, nonpolar. So there is no like positive and negative end like a polar molecule. So we have very little attraction. This dispersion or London force that's present here or in just the inert gases is said to have come about because we have a distribution of electrons. This molecule has electrons, whether localized or delocalized. And at any given moment, the uh, electrons are not perfectly balanced. And so this will be offset at one moment. Mm, this will be offset at one moment. We can have a slight attractive force. It's extremely weak. Type 2 molecules, we're going to go ahead and see a polar effect. And so if we have a molecule that is polar, and let me hold one up, that's going to be methanol in this case. Water is polar. It undergoes the same thing. With methanol, what we have is we have a negative end over here because of the oxygen and two lone pairs of electrons, and a rather positive end over here without an electron pig. So I'm going to point my hand going towards this side going, this is where the electrons are. Think of this as being a magnet of sorts. Negative end, positive end. So a neighbor could come up next to it, and it's not going to align itself this way with two negative ends towards each other. There's a preferred orientation where we're going to have positive, negative, positive, negative. They're going to line up. So they're going to act like magnets and line up. There's a nice attraction. So we call this a Roman numeral 2 or polar attraction. Uh, let's go ahead and make a little note here that this happens with water. And how about this one? Very similar to methane, nice and balanced CH4, except it's no longer nice and balanced. CH3 and somebody's replaced one of the hydrogens with a fluorine, so we have a polar molecule. Type 3, and this is going to be the strongest attraction that we see in molecules, is called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding occurs when we have an extremely electronegative element. Let me list those. When we have oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen present, and off of one of these is a hydrogen atom. If we have hydrogen attached to one of the big three electronegative elements, we find that this is an extremely polar bond. The electrons are pulled towards the oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen and taken away from the hydrogen. Let me show you the effect using water of this. I'm going to draw a water molecule. And on the left, I don't want to kind of distract, so I'm going to make a bond there in the form of a single line. Let me make this bond in the form of a pair of electrons. We know that this pair of electrons is, well, pulled towards the oxygen because oxygen is very electronegative compared to hydrogen. Now that's going to mean that this oxygen is rather electronegative. It has the electrons pulled towards it. And this hydrogen is having the electrons ripped away from it. So we put a little note there that it's electropositive. Now the result is this is one water molecule. 
say another water molecule is positioned right near it, it's going to orient itself like this. A pair of electrons being negative are highly attracted to the positive right there, and we form a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are always denoted with dotted lines like this, and it's a very strong attraction. All three of these attractions, considered for molecules, dispersion or London forces are actually in inert gases. They're in nonpolar molecules. They're also in polar molecules, but very insignificant compared to the polar effect. And it's in hydrogen bonding molecules, but insignificant compared to hydrogen bonding. Polar occurs when you have a polar molecule, and hydrogen bonding occurs when you have hydrogen attached directly to an electronegative element. As we go to the right, the melting and the boiling points go ahead and increase. Instead of writing ionic compounds, you are free to write ionic solids because these are now solids at room temperature and pressure. The weakest would be a plus one, minus one, metal, non-metal combination. Think of these as being weak magnets, plus one, minus one. Over here, we get the strongest, plus two, minus two. These are stronger magnets, force of attraction is greater. So calcium oxide melts at a higher temperature than sodium chloride because of the strength of the charges, two and two instead of one and one. In the middle here, an intermediate, plus two minus one is in between sodium chloride and calcium oxide. Over here, upon first inspection, these look to be identical. Plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Their melting points are extremely close, but we find that sodium fluoride has a melting point that's just a little bit higher than sodium chloride. If you will, since these have the same charges, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, it's as though we think of this as being in need of a tiebreaker, going, well, which one's going to win? Size wins. Here it goes. Sodium plus and sodium plus are present in both of these. So let's put sodium plus down. They are going to be sodium ions of exactly the same size. The chloride is matched up with this one. And let me exaggerate and show chloride as being really large. And fluoride. Let me exaggerate and make it pretty small compared to the chloride. The idea is because the periodic table of the element shows chlorine as being lower, it's going to be bigger than fluorine. Take a look at a periodic table. Fluorine sits above chlorine in the periodic table in group seven. Now, chlorine is really big compared to fluorine, which means that the center of the charge of chlorine is going to be further away from sodium than the center of charge in the fluorine. The analogy of the magnets works really nice. Two magnets that are far apart that's not too much force. It's easy to pull them apart. Two magnets that are closer, greater force, harder to pull apart. So we have ourselves a trend. Inert gases, type 1, type 2, type 3 interactions. We call these intermolecular forces, forces between the molecules. Nonpolar gives us dispersion, or also known as London forces. Polar are stronger, higher melting points. Hydrogen bonding are the strongest out of these. Hydrogen bonding gives us the strongest intermolecular force and is present with oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen if we have a hydrogen bonded to it. Higher in temperature are the ionic solids. Charges, plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two. And you can have things like plus three, minus three even stronger. When you need a tiebreaker, the smaller ion has the closer charge. More energy to bust this apart. And then finally, your network covalence, very high in temperature.